good evening to the audience of, of public who have come to hear this discussion on the Tobago Sandals MOU and, of course, the Freedom of Information Act. I was interviewed on the media yesterday morning. I think it was on TV5 and on Tambourine Radio. And one of the people, I forget who, in fact, it probably doesn't matter who, asked me what was my concern with this? Because after all, I don't have any business in Tobago. So why was I concerned with it? He didn't put it quite like that, but that was what he was saying. And it's a pretty common opinion. So the first thing we need to understand, if we step back, is that if you look at the map, Trinidad and Tobago is that small. It's really preposterous. There's no other word for it, it's preposterous. And if we hold in fast to the notion that Tobago is different from Trinidad, it's different from Karani, it's different from Dico Martin, and Bacalet is different from Crown Point, and so on and so forth, with the regionalism. What's the point about regionalism? Better we forget CARICOM. Forget Pan-Africanism, right? Forget Ethiopia and Ghana and Nigeria, you know, those places are far. It's preposterous. Nothing less. This is a called Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm a citizen, and I'm doing an analysis. It's not an opinion. It's an analysis based on primary research. An opinion is something that everybody has, like the color of my shirt, or what Dr. Rowley should have done last week, or what Kamala should have done five years ago. Those are opinions. This is an analysis you're going to be hearing, based on primary research that I've been doing for years. The second point about the Tobago reference, because the points need to be engaged, to be dismantled, is that I'm the head of Raymond and Pear Limited, and Raymond and Pear Limited has significant business in Tobago. We've had significant business in Tobago for over 40 years. So the fact that I live in Port of Spain, and all of that stuff, is really and truly irrelevant. I have business in Tobago. The same way that you Tobagonian brothers and sisters who are here, you are business with what takes place in Port of Spain. If the people in Port of Spain do stupidness, it's business with you. Okay, it's our business. And if we're serious about regionalism, and about Pan-Africanism, and about Caribbean unity, and all that nice touchy-feely stuff, we can't be serious about Trinidad and Tobago and making those differences. We have to make a choice, okay? So it's, it's a serious point to think about before we even get into anything about Sanders and the Freedom of Information Act and any of that stuff. Hi. So we have a situation in which when the current administration was elected as Dr. Keith Rowley and his team uh, in September of 2015, one of the early announcements Dr. Rowley made was that he had had discussions with Butch Stewart, who's the head of Sandals, with the idea to bring the Sandals Resort to Tobago. And that Stewart had said, let's talk about it if you win the election. Of course, Dr. Rowley's team won the election. Therefore, we're in this situation now. And, and there's, a, there's an issue there, but that's not an issue I'm going to make a big thing about, I'll just mention it, that the, the, the actual proposal wasn't tendered, so there wasn't any competitive process. Someone was selected. But we need to note one point about it, because we were trying to have a thorough conversation and analysis based on the facts. The only other large-scale resort that we have built in this country with public funds was the Tobago Hilton, now known as Magdalena Grand. Some of you may not know it, but the Magdalena Grand formerly Tobago Hilton, started off under a competitive process. The Prime Minister at the time, which was Mr. Pandey, the bad old days, he didn't just pick somebody. There was a process. Advertisements were placed internationally. Four seasons, intercontinental, the body shop sportif, Hilton, reputable international hotels came here and did what they call a beauty contest. They made presentations, they had projections. 
how they would do this, how they would do employment, how they would handle food, and so on and so on. And at the end of that process, Hilton was selected. The, the learning to get from that factual lesson is that even though we went through a competitive process, Tobago Hilton founded. So a, 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 an important safeguard was, was honored and was kept in place, and the project, which is large scale, still founded. In this case, an important safeguard has not been kept. Just facts. Not an opinion, it's facts. An important safeguard has not been kept. Let's move on. So we engaged the process, and I'm going to walk through what I call four circles of responsibility, because we have to analyze this, again, based on the facts. And it's not a question of being personal. After Dr. Rowley made the announcement, which was after he won the election, he announced that they were establishing a team to negotiate with the Sandals people. That team, I won't say committee, but it was a team, was chaired by Wendell Motley, the former Minister of Finance. On that, on that team was Dr. Terence Farrell, who at the time was head of the Economic Development Advisory Board. There was Dr. Rolf Balgobin, who at the time was chairman of CL Financial and chairman of Angostura, former head of the business school at UWE. It was high caliber people in that team. So that is team number one up here. That's a fact, that team was established to negotiate with the Stewart team. A little bit again, and we stopped hearing from that team. We didn't really hear any reports from them, but a little bit again, if you look in the papers, you could Google it and see it. You see photographs of people in meetings with Butch Stewart and Adam Stewart, and you see people like Conrad Enel, my good friend. You see people like, um, I think Mr. Wilfred Espine, who is the chairman of Petrotrain, he's in some of the pictures. I see my brother at the back there. You were in some of the pictures too. I, I, Mr. Dr. Hazel. Yeah, Dr. Hazel was in some of the pictures too. Okay, Dr. Selvan Hazel, es esteemed economist. I know Selvan. Okay. So that's team number two. Number three, we have established state agencies. So you have a tourism ministry a Ministry of Tourism in our government, with a permanent secretary and an office and a budget and everything. I, I don't think I've heard much from them about this project. You have a Tobago House of Assembly with particular responsibilities and rights under the THA Act. I haven't heard much from them. I mean, you, um, the, the head of the THA from time to time would be at a meeting and you'd be sitting in a picture and so. You had the Tourism Development Company, TDC, which was wound up towards the end of 2016. And in its place, we have a new agency called the Tate Tobago Tourism Agency. I've hardly heard from them. And then you have a new state enterprise. I'm taking my time with this, it's all facts, eh? You have a new state enterprise called Golden Roof Baku Limited. We'll come back to them, in which we are told the property will be vested and they'll be the counterparty to the agreement with Sandals. So that's the third circle of responsibility. And then the fourth circle is the cabinet, because of course the MOU, which I have a copy of up here with me, was signed by the then Minister of Tourism, Shampo Kaljo, who's a member of parliament from Tobago. And the question really has to be, it's not just a question of calling out a book of lists, the question has to be, who approved this agreement? Because the terms of the agreement, on my analysis, are terms that we cannot get back the money. We are not going to get back the money we're spending. Okay? We're not going to get it back. We're supposed to spend, I think it's close to $3 billion to build the resort. Some people have estimated seven and eight billion dollars. That is um, Mr. Amy Elias, my erstwhile colleague. I, do, I don't agree with those estimates. They're way too high, but people have their reasons and so on. I don't, I don't agree with that, that's too high, okay? The fact of the matter is that the agreement, the MOU that I obtained, I had to sue the government. I wrote to them on the 27th of February this year. And the 27th of February is important because on that date, Adam Stewart, 
made a point of going to all the media. It was in the Express Guardian and Newsday to say there was no secret. The MOU doesn't have a secret. There's nothing to hide and blah, 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 and rah, rah, rah. So of course, the same day I wrote to the permanent secretary in the office of the prime minister. That's Mr. Maurice Sweet, and we come back to him just now too. And Mr. Sweet wrote and said to me, you can't give it to me because there's a confidentiality clause. And the fight started. Because as we used to say when I was growing up, it's either or either. It can't be that they don't have a secret, but you can't tell me. It can't be that they don't have a secret, but it's confidential on all these word games. We're dealing with a circle of responsibility. After nine months of what I could describe as nothing less than stupidness, they had a four-page letter from the chief state solicitor, supposedly written from some senior counsel, explaining why I couldn't see the thing. When we got a date to go to court, the evening before, they kept a press conference and they, they gave it out to everybody. And they asked Stuart Young whether it was to do with the court case. And he says, nothing to do with Afro Raymond. It's just one of those things, you know. So it's like, it, to me, it's very disrespectful. It's like them alone went to school. OK? We didn't go to school. We used to go to school in recess. You know, it's real stupidness. The fact of the matter is that there was no intention to disclose the MOU. But then, we need to pause and understand what the MOU says. The MOU says that Sandals and Beaches are going to establish a resort here. They give a total number of rooms of about 800 and something rooms, 820 rooms or something. The application that was made to the EMA was for 925 rooms and for 25 restaurants. And the entire expense of building the resort is to be on the Trinidad and Tobago government. So our treasury is to fund the whole resort. The actual phrase is, I'm going to read it out for you. All costs of constructing and outfitting the resorts in a ready for guest state, including the cost of the soft and the grand openings, shall be for the account of the government. OK? And in addition to that, there is a, there's a promise in the MOU to make certain concessions and incentives available to Sandals. They don't say what exactly those are. So we have an unknown quantity in terms of what that is. We also have a phenomena when governments of small countries, even large countries, are dealing with multinationals. There's a phenomenon known as transfer pricing. So if country A, which is where the wealth is really being generated, is a country with a, with a strong level of taxation, 25, 30, 35%. And country B, which doesn't do anything but register companies, has a tax of 1%, like St. Lucia or Panama, one of those places. It's possible, in the absence of proper law enforcement, it's possible to set up your company that, in fact, you never pay any taxes without breaking any law. So, for example, there's a, whole, there's a whole international thing about a tax justice network and so on when you get into this thing. So one of the reasons I don't buy anything on Amazon, because Amazon don't pay any taxes. They're never going to see my money. I don't care how attractive it is, it could be for two cents, I'm not spending any money on Amazon. I used to, but now that I educated myself, I don't. Okay? It doesn't matter to me that they don't break the law, it's just wrong. Breaking the law is the starting point, that's not the ending point. Okay? So, Starbucks, for example, in the United Kingdom, has 700 branches, over 700 branches in the United Kingdom, Starbucks. They pay zero tax in the UK. The same thing, transfer pricing. And it would surprise you to know that the agreement which our government signed with Sandals, which is called an MOU, actually facilitates transfer pricing. It says that. The government acknowledges that Sanders intends to establish subsidiaries, affiliates, and associate companies. Those are euphemisms. Euphemisms for transfer pricing devices and transfer pricing manipulation of our money. Because the money in the country is our money. This is a fundamental question. Okay. 
If Kamala Prasad is a serving government, I'll be saying exactly the same thing. If it's wrong, it's wrong, and if it's right, it's right. These are euphemisms for tax evasion mechanisms, and our government has signed an agreement at page five, clause B1. The government acknowledges that Sandals intends, not that Sandals may, you know, Sandals intends to establish subsidiaries, affiliates, and associate companies to hold the management agreement, operate the resorts, and here this lovely one, and otherwise operate its role. Nice, eh? Sweet, sweet, sweet like a Julie Mango. <laughs> and you see what's interesting about this? Because we're describing an agreement, as far as I'm concerned, on my analysis of the agreement, that is, in fact, tragic for the country. For example, some people, I know some people support the project, and they support the project on the grounds of employment. That is going to be about 2,000 jobs created when the resort is running, the sandals and beaches, and that, in fact, it'll be an opportunity for Trinidadians and Tobagonians to work at sandals and get jobs at a time of high unemployment. And I can't, I can't laugh at that. I have a job, and it's a serious thing. Okay, so to be able to get a job is a serious thing. But in fact, the agreement, this is how it reads. Clause B5 on page six tells us, Sandals shall employ qualified TNT nationals. It goes on to say, at its sole discretion, be the final determinant regarding its suitability for employment of all candidate employees such that the standard of the brand can be attained and maintained. Here the last part, you notice this thing is in the tail. The government will expeditiously grant as many work permits as are required. You all like that? <laughs> Sweet, eh? Sweet like a Julie Mango, expeditiously. As many as required. Okay, that's what we signed up for, our elected representatives in this republic. That's what we signed up for. And I think it's wrong. That's, that's, that is my analysis of this agreement. Okay? That's my analysis of the agreement. Agriculture, because there are other people who support the project, and they support the project on the grounds of agriculture. That the hotel is a large scale enterprise. It'll be buying fruits and vegetables and meat and eggs and all of these things, and need, they need people to fix things in the hotel and so on, whether it's air conditioner, water pumps, you know, gardening and so on and so on. And again, it's interesting the way the clause is written. Clause six and seven on page six says that Sandals is to give preference to purchasing local agricultural and other inputs. Subject to the proviso that those are available in adequate quantity, quality, or comparable price. Which really is a kind of a loophole that would allow you to do what you please, just like with the employment. Okay. So we are putting out all the money, they're putting out no money. Let's look at it. Let's do a little a little Checklist, okay? We putting out all the money, they putting out no money. That's a fact. It's in the agreement. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. Second point. They can operate transfer pricing to fix up the books. The polite way they some manipulate the accounts, but to cook up the thing. So in fact, if we're supposed to get 10% of something, they can make that something come down to almost nothing. Under the management agreement. If we're supposed to get 11.5% of another thing, they could fix that 11.5% so it's almost nothing. That's what transfer pricing means. That's how come Starbucks would have over 700 branches in the UK, which is a wealthier country than ours, and don't pay any tax. Look it up, the Global Tax Justice Network, look it up. Don't take my word for it. Find out about Amazon and Starbucks and Apple and these companies and how they operate. Don't pay any tax. So the, company, the countries where they actually generate any money, they don't pay any tax there. They pay taxes other places. It's a race to the bottom, and we need to be aware of it. It's a question of economic and financial literacy. But if, you see, it raises an important question for me. There's also the environmental aspect that I want to talk about. There are people here who I would describe as environmentalists. I don't describe myself as an environmentalist. I've never spoken against the environment. It's an important concern. It's what economists call an externality. So you could value a piece of land, which is what I do for a living, 
and say this piece of land is 100 million, and you're going to put down a project that is 3 billion, and prepare a valuation of that, and raise money, and do all kinds of commercial things. <clears throat> but there are costs that come with those operations. And those cost economists describe them as externalities. So for instance, a development on this scale, on a piece of land like that, I come into the Ramsar just now, a development of this scale on a piece of land like this, with the proposals for a large golf course, the consumption of water, the use of chemicals to maintain the greens, and the impact on the waterways underground, okay, has an impact off-site, that the rest of the society has absorbed that cost. So if there are wells that are compromised two miles down the road, that's not on Sandler's property. You see, that's why they call it externalities. Okay, and this is one of the things they learn when you study environmental issues. The issues bleed into each other, literally and metaphorically. It's interesting that clause four on page six of the MOU actually reads that Sanders is to meet all locally acceptable environmental standards and requirements in all phases of the operation of the resort. Now that reads like a really benign clause. It reads, it reads well. But then you start asking yourself, well, what about the Ramsar Convention, which is the International Convention to Protect Important Wetlands? Trinidad and Tobago has three Ramsar sites. This is one of them, the only one in Tobago. And those are international obligations our country has in terms of how we maintain the, the, the validity and the integrity of those wetlands. And one has to smile at the choice of phrase. So we have an international obligation, yeah, the Ramsar Convention. But we have a, a document signed by our government which obliges sandals to follow locally acceptable environmental standards and requirements. Is it one of those things that lawyers do when you write up something? So you say you'll follow anything on the left, but you're not going to follow us over here on the right. So I think we need to have that clarified as well, okay? Because I don't think that choice of phrases in these circumstances is a coincidence. I wouldn't look at it as benign. It sounds benign, but when you think about it, mm -mm not benign. So we come to the question of responsibility. And this is where it gets really interesting, because up to now we're warming up. Eh? It gets really interesting now. So we have an agreement in which we spend all the money, they spend no money. They can manipulate prices through transfer pricing to fix up our percentage to be whatever they say it is. We don't have any employment guaranteed. They could come here for 40 years, because it's 25 years with an option to renew for 15 years. Eh? They could come here for 40 years and don't hire a single Trinidadian or Tobagonian. And they wouldn't be in breach. Understand me? In addition, they can buy all their produce offshore. Because they have existing, because of the size of the resort, they have existing arrangements for the other resorts and so on, the other islands and so on. They have, they have, they have robust arrangements in place. And my mind is asking myself the question, who's responsible for this agreement? Is it that Mr. Butch Stewart wrote it, or his team, his attorneys, and just sent it to us and we signed it? Who agreed this? Did the committee chaired by Wendell Motley agree with this? I am serious, this is a serious question. And Mr. Motley just received our highest national award, and he's somebody I have a lot of respect for. But I'm asking a question. Did Mr. Wendell Motley approve of this? Did Dr. Terence Farrell think this was a good, a good framework? What about Dr. Rolf Balgoman? He thought it was good? You understand me? I know one of our brothers in the audience, he would probably speak in the, the Q&A, okay? What about Conrad Enel, former Minister of Finance, another former Minister of Finance? Does he think it's a good idea? Mr. Espine, who's head of Petrofin, does he think it's a good idea? The THA. The Tobago Tourism Agency. Where are they? <laughs> and we need to understand that 
This question of responsibility is not a light one. I really want to know. Leroy Clark has a classic phrase he uses, Leroy Clark and I don't agree about everything. Heaven knows we argue cat and, cat and mouse. But I will invoke him, talking about charting the ruins. This is about charting the ruins. Because it's wrong, it's wrong like a crick's biscuit. How it got so wrong? How it got so wrong? Who agreed this? Somebody thought this was good? Did Trinidad and Tobago push back? How did we push back? What clauses did we change? I am very serious. Is it that the committees of Mr. Motley and Mr. Hazel was involved in another group and so on had made proposals that were rejected by the cabinet? It can't be both of them, it's either or either. You understand? It can't be both of them. Because we didn't just get here by accident. It is, you can't tell me that Mr. Butch Stewart just faxed this thing down here and we sign it. Was there a negotiation, yes or no? Was advice given? Was advice taken? What was the framework going into this? Because you're going to get to the framework now. This is interesting. You're not going to be able to understand these things unless you understand the framework. And part of the false narrative, I'm saying it like it is a false narrative. Part of the false narrative is that in fact, these are arrangements everybody should be comfortable with because you already have arrangements like this with Hilton in Trinidad and Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain and Tobago Magdalena and it's been done before and we shouldn't be worried and those people are, what's the word? Naysayers, <laughs> okay? But that's a false narrative. One more time, a false narrative. Let's talk about it. So we have agreements with the Trinidad and Tobago government, build the hotels, the ones I just called. And we have agreements in which those hotels have been operating for quite a while. And my contention is that we don't know either the terms and conditions of the agreement or how it's been performed. The only agreement that's been published is the agreement for Trinidad Hilton, the one near the Savannah. And in my opinion, I'm saying publish, it's, it's, it's registered as a lease at the Registrar General's department. In my opinion, it was registered probably as a mistake. Probably somebody who lost their job or something right afterwards. Because try as you might, you cannot get anybody to give you any performance figures for Trinidad Hilton. Now, I know what the reason is. Eh? I'm not going to say it here. But there's a reason why you can't get anybody to give the performance figures for Trinidad Hilton. Study all your head good, there's a reason. It was built in 1962, the year of independence. It's been there 56 years. And nobody knows the performance figures. It's like a mystery in an enigma, wrapped up in a shroud, okay? And somebody wants to tell you that we should be comfortable because that's the model. A false narrative. Let's talk about the second one. <laughs> Magdalena Grandi, one in Tobago. Used to be known as Tobago Hilton, built in about 2000. And the Joint Select Committee of Parliament, because you have to just, there's no proper reporting, eh? You have to just watch them closely and mark them. Like we say a long time, you're, you're mining a mark, you watch them, and you get a chance to glimpse something, because they have no intention of reporting anything properly. The Magdalena Hotel, the Joint Select Committee, had a meeting on the 9th of April this year with ETEC, and they were discussing the Magdalena Hotel. And ETEC submitted statements. They weren't audited statements, don't worry, they didn't break their record. They just submitted statements of some sort to the Joint Select Committee. And some of the statements will shock you. Let me read some of them, some of the points, the main points. For every dollar, earned by the Magdalena, this is this year, April 9th. For every dollar earned by the Magdalena, the operating cost was $1.60 or $1.70. That's the successful model to be following, right? This was the case even when the hotel had good occupancy in 2014 and 2015. That's, that's the tragedy that we're looking at. And I should be confident because that's what we're following. 
Some may consider Magdalena a three or four star resort. The physical condition did not say that. The revenue per available room is one of the measures you use when you're evaluating the performance of hotels. It used to be $98 US in 2014. And it declined to $55 US in 2017, below par. Because the other hotels operating in this country had an average, they call it rev par, of $131. So Magdalena was less than half the average of the other hotels. So that is the Magdalena one. The other example, interestingly, is the Hyatt one. So Hyatt is the one that I think closely resembles a successful hotel. Okay, is it downtown in Port of Spain, five star, very often full of different events, government events and graduations and weddings and different conferences and so. And it's interesting, when I started up on this campaign about two and a half years ago, you get little things coming out now. It's interesting in response. And uh, the Minister of Trade and Industry, that was Senator Paula Gopi Schoon, she spoke with the Senate on the 1st of May this year. And she was telling the Senate about the Hyatt Regency's net profits. And she was listing the net profits for the last five years. And it's very interesting. So in 2013, it was 75.7 .7 million. In 2014, it was 76 million. In 2015, it was 66.3. 2016, it was 51. And 2017, it was 60 million. And then, of course, what's interesting in Hansard is that people who were in the Senate tried to question her about it. So you have Senator Hossein, one of the UNC senators, asked her, having regard for the decline in profits between 2013 and 2017, can the minister indicate what is the reason? Because it went from 76 down to 60. Hey, the minister, I'm not able at this time to give any concrete reasons as to why. But you should note as well that between 16 and 17, there was an increase of 20%. Senator Obika, another UNC senator, he put a question. Could the Honorable Minister inform the Senate what dividends, you see this is the important thing, the underlying commercial arrangement, what is the dividend? Because we have the profit figure. We understand the government is a shareholder. What is the dividend applied to the government for the respective years? Here's the minister. No, no, the president of the Senate. No, no, I wouldn't allow that question. Next question, please. You want you to understand what's going on in this country. People who talk about the model working. Here the last one now. Senator Mark, that's Senator Wade Mark. Could I ask the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry whether these net profit figures represent, from your perspective as the minister, an adequate return on our investment at that particular enterprise? To me, it's a reasonable question. Here's the minister. That evokes a subjective answer from me, and I'm not prepared to do that. You see? Okay, that's what we delimit, it. Eh? So the model is really, really working, except we just can't get any numbers, not yet, okay? As far as I'm concerned, it's not working. Because let me give you my translation of it. And as I said, this is an analysis based on the facts. These are the dates that these people spoke in parliament. Eh? There's not any he say, she say, and I like this one, I don't like that one. These are facts. If those enterprises were working, Hyatt Regency, Magdalena Grand, and Trinidad Hilton were working profitably as companies in which the state had an interest because we own the property and we have shares in it. If they were working profitably, the politicians in this country, and this is not about PNM or UNC, the politicians, the leadership we have in the Caribbean, they'd be boasting about it. The same way they boasted when Caribbean Airlines made a profit the other day, remember that? They said Caribbean Airlines returned the profitability and everybody was happy. It was in all the press. Quite rightfully, if a company does well, you boast about it. They never boast about these ones. Study it good. They never boast about it. So nobody's going to convince me to give me a six five nine and convince me this is working. And this is a good model. And really? Show me the figures. You could, up to now they cannot show figures. 1962 Trinidad Hilton. And this now comes to the point, returning to Sandals. And the question really has to be why? at this moment in time, 
has this MOU been released? Because from the beginning, we were told that it cannot be released because it's a confidentiality clause. And Dr. Rowley was very strong about it. Minister Stuart Young was very strong about it. Other people may have spoken, but those are the two I can remember. And they were very strong saying, listen, this is a commercial negotiation. And if you're in a commercial negotiation and you give out the details, you're going to poison the negotiation. That was the position in summary. And you cannot give out those details. And the people who are asking for that are mischief makers, and there are people who don't understand how government business really runs. The question, the big question has to be, so what changed? How is it that on the 28th of November, since the 27th of February, you were telling me you couldn't give it to me, and you had all these reasons. What happened on the 28th of November? Forget the court case for a second. What happened? That it was all of a sudden possible to give it out. Now, there's two ways to look at it. Eh? One way to look at it is to take up a charitable explanation that says, listen, they're human beings in cabinet, just like the rest of us. And they had an opinion at the start of the year. And they talked about it, and they discussed it, and they took advice, and they changed their mind. And they realized it was a bad thing they were doing, and it's a good thing to give the information. It's in the interest of transparency. It will close down the lawsuit, and the public needs to know, and they publish it, and that's a good thing. That's a charitable explanation. The real world explanation, the world I live in, the world of commercial negotiations, and this sort of thing, what would have been happening in the 10 months between the 10th of October 2017, when this MOU was signed, and the 28th of November 2018, when it was released, what would have been happening is that the parties would have been in discussions. The parties would have been agreeing this and agreeing that. And Minister Stuart Young told us in one of his recent statements that, in fact, a firm from New York had been instructed to prepare the documents, the, the actual contracts, the binding contracts, because this is non-binding. The MOU is non-binding. And that, that firm, White and Case, from Wall Street, was going to have the contracts ready, and they were going to be signed around the middle of December, which is any time now, because it is the 13th of December. So this is a very timely and important meeting. And if that is the case, the way that solicitors work, White and Case are not negotiating an agreement. They're writing up an agreement that has been negotiated. I am talking as somebody who sat in those negotiations, led negotiating teams. We construct the deal. We negotiators construct the deal, sign off on it, and then we give it to a lawyer to write it up in advance of attorneys becoming involved. The second explanation is that negotiations could have advanced to the point, and agreements could have been signed off that mean that the actual Sandals contract, just to use one phrase, is it actually gotten to an irreversible point. But we cannot go back. We cannot renegotiate anything. And in fact, it's immaterial whether they release the MOU. So you release the MOU, you get some points for PR, you extinguish the litigation with me. But in fact, the deal is intact because everything is signed off. Now, we don't know the answer, but I would like to use this opportunity again, because I did it in yesterday's newspaper column, to call on the powers that be, maybe Dr. Rowley, maybe Mr. Young, to just explain this question to us. Which one is it? Is it A, that everything is still in discussion, and it's still in negotiation? Or is it B, that it's too late and we've gone past that point? I think we need to know. If it is A, that things are still in discussion, we need to return to this agreement and set out a roadmap of how the agreement could be improved if we are proceeding. Okay? If we are proceeding. Some of the features, I would just close by giving three suggestions for ways that this agreement could be improved. What I would consider professionally, commercially, to be things that must be in agreement like this. First of all, we are spending $3 billion worth of capital. What is our rate of return? There needs to be some kind of flaw to our rate of return, like a preference share. 
It cannot be that we are putting money in. And if this and if that and if that and if that, we're going to get money. There has to be some kind of a flaw. F L O O R. Not a flaw like in this agreement. <laughs> a flaw, okay? There's some kind of a flaw in terms of rate of return. What is the ROI? To put it in MBA language. I can't accept an agreement on these terms that has an ROI as a silent cousin in the agreement. But both Stewart's interests are front and center. That, that can't work for me. It's unacceptable. Second point, the employment point. Because we talked about employment opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago citizens within the, within the, the resort. And of course, Sandals would naturally want to preserve their quality of service and so on, and not to impair their brand. But I think we need to have a broader view of this thing. This project, if it were to go ahead as intended, because it's supposed to start, I think they said January next month is supposed to start. If this project was to go ahead as intended, it's supposed to take about two years to build. It's supposed to employ just under 2,000 people. I forget the exact number. It might be 1,800 or 17 something or whatever. Here's my point. You mean to tell me that we had some of our brightest and our best people negotiating this, and we couldn't put in 10% as a quota? That on day one, so on the 1st of January 2021, when the doors of Sanders and Beaches open, we have 200 Trinidad and Tobago citizens working in there, not just as waitresses and barmen, but at all levels, food and beverage manager, front of house manager, maintenance manager. Maybe some of them are waitresses and barmen too. But Sanders have a college where they train their people. We should be picking young people now with the unemployment in this country. 150 or 200 of them, that should be in the contract. It can't be a silent part. What happened to our young people? We betray them? We leave them behind? It's a carnival band, but Stuart front and center? What is it? 150 to 200 people should be selected every year to be trained. Sanders have resorts through the Caribbean. So we put in three billion. Let them put a stipend for the young people to work in Grenada, to work in Barbados, to work in St. Lucia, to learn as you go along. When the oil and gas companies were here 50 and 60 years ago, we like, we can't learn our head hard. When the oil and gas companies were here 50 and 60 years ago, they used to take young people out of school 16 and 17 years and train them as electrician and pipe fitter and welder and mechanic and diesel mechanic. That was part of their contract to be in Trinidad and Tobago. Stick breaking we years. Listen to me, stick breaking we. Go back and read it. I'm not making up anything. This is the facts in this country. A lot of the people in this country are established now in those professions. They got free training, and maybe even economy is not free because the companies were getting benefits from the country. It was part of the agreement for Texaco to be here. Understand what I'm saying very well. But that understanding appears to have broken down, and I'm not going to be silent about it. I'm not going to be silent. I don't know with Dr. Rowley or the PNM or the UNC or anybody, whoever is there, and they came in an agreement with this, I'd be making these statements. We lost our way. Bad, 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 bad. Okay? So the second point has to be employment. There have to be quotas and a mechanism, not just a figure. Like a, like a, like a, like a what do you call it, a local content figure, 15%. And nobody knows how we're going to get a 15. You have to set out a map that is telling me they're going to go to Malik Comprehensive and Signal Hill and you're going to go and you're going to pick people, young people, who do home economics or whatever, 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 and put them in a program. And they have to rotate through hands, through sandals. Listen to me well. And after the first year, let it go up to 15%. Next two years is 15%. Why not? Is that a problem? The oil and gas companies did it and they all made billions of dollars here. So what is wrong? Is that different deal now? Why is it different? Why is it different? Nobody can answer, you see. We must ask the people who are promoting this, why is it different? And if they agree this. So this is nonsense, eh? I tell you, this is real nonsense, eh? It's frightening. 
Third point, local content. So we talked about agriculture. The vegetables, the fruits, the milk, the eggs, and all the things you need to run a resort, because there's thousands of people that are there, eating and drinking three, four meals a day, and so on and so on, rum punch and fruit punch and all that kind of thing. What are we going to do in terms of setting in place arrangements and quotas to get people involved in that? I know agriculture in the country is in a problem, but we also have a situation of high unemployment. We have different technologies you could use, aquaponics, hydroponics, and certainly, if you have a guaranteed market, you have the incentives to get involved and to set up a business growing food to sell the sandals. But we can't be silent about this, because trust me, if we are silent about it, nobody else is going to speak up from us. Eh? Nobody from Canada coming to rescue us. Eh? Understand that? Eh? Nobody from the States coming down here to rescue us. And anything. Here is not one of those places. Eh? And don't tell yourself that here can't go through. Don't tell yourself that. Civilizations that are bigger than ours, that had more temples and buildings and pyramids and all kind of things, went through. Because the leadership lost their way. When you study history, deep history, places that were thousands and thousands of times bigger than here, they lost their way. They're not there again. It's dust in the wind. It's dust in the desert. So don't tell yourself, here is here, and Trinidad and Tobago forever. No, it's not forever. And if you don't have a conscious grasp of what is happening in your country, based on facts, any kind of number could play. OK? So I'm coming down to the end. For those of you who are getting a little worried, <laughs> I'm coming down to the end. Um, uh, I think that we have colleagues from the environmental group who are going to speak, I'm sure, at greater length. I'm not an environmental expert by any means, but I welcome if, if they would like to say things in relation to this project. They are they are, as I said in my earlier part of my address, there are international obligations we have signed up to. And this Boku, Boku Reef um, National Park is, our, is one of three Ramsar sites in the country. Okay? So it's a matter of international obligations the country has taken on. Okay? The development, as proposed, will have an impact. I am dissatisfied with the lack of proper arrangements or any proposals as to making proper arrangements for employment, for local content. And in fact, the arrangement facilitates transfer pricing. I would like to see open book accounting. And I'm going to suggest one last thing to you all before I wrap. There's a, there's a lovely speech. It's not lovely. I've just been facetious. There's an awful speech on YouTube of the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda. His name is um, Honorable Gaston Brown. Brown with an E, so we call them Brown E. <laughs> um, Gaston Brown is um, speaking on the 30th of June of 2017. It's on YouTube, so let's look it up. Gaston Brown, 30th of June 2017, about sandals. And Brown speaks for an hour and 11 minutes. And they had a situation in Antigua and Barbuda where sandals and themselves got into a little bit of a shoving match. And Sandals closed down the place for five months. And they, they had a kind of argument about some taxes. And so I won't get into all of it. But the point I want to bring to this discussion, to be decisive, is that Sandals spent the money to build the resort in Antigua and Barbuda. It was their money. It was their resort. And although they had invested the huge amount of money you need to invest to build a resort on that scale, they were ready, willing, and able to try to gangster. I'm going to say it like it is. To try to gangster the elected government in, Ang and, uh, in Antigua and Barbuda into giving up some of their taxes, put a gun to their head by saying, we're going to close here for five months. Now, you might wonder, where am I going with this? Just how you analyze negotiations. If over here, because we're dealing with one company, if over here, the company had hundreds of millions of dollars invested in a property. But to be able to extort more concessions and to put pressure on the government, as I said, to gangster them, they could close the resort for five months. And that was really bad. And that's what Gaston Brown is talking about. Look at the video. If that could happen over here in the last two or three years in Antigua and Barbuda, that happened. 
Trinidad and Tobago is entering a situation where Mr. Sanders is not putting any money. Understand me well, he's not putting, we are putting all the money. So he doesn't have any capital at risk. So at the drop of a pin, he could say I close him for nine months. Because I don't like this and I don't like that. He had all the money invested over here and he could close for five months and put them under immense pressure. Over here, there's no money invested. So we, in terms of an analysis of the facts, not an opinion, it's an analysis of facts. On an analysis of the facts, we are in fact exposed, when you analyze the, risk, analyze the risks, we are exposed to a far greater extent than Antigua and Barbuda was. If it in the Antigua and Barbuda story was awful, and it was really awful. Our exposure is several times greater. I would close there. Thank you for your attention, and of course, I'm welcoming questions. Thank you very much. Was there in the MOU any confidentiality clause that you saw? Yes, there was. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry, Margaret, I didn't put it in. Let me just read it for oh, you. No, I was, I was very disturbed. No, I'll answer you. I was very disturbed to see as the penultimate clause in the MOU that the parties agreed and acknowledged that each party would treat the contents of the MOU as confidential. And what's interesting is that there's actually a revolution taking place now. There's so many of them taking place globally. Eh? The illusion of global stability is just that, as an illusion. But there's a revolution taking place now. I forget where. It might be somewhere like um, in, in one of the former Eastern European states. And they're actually forcing the parliament there to take up a position that no official at any point in the future could sign any agreement with any non-disclosure or confidential because you cannot do that. That is jail. You cannot do that. It's a public money, it's public land, it's a public project. You can, if, you, if you sign anything with confidential, prison for you. They, they're very serious over there. We have to get serious. This is rubbish. Why is it confidential? Because now you come and you publish the whole thing and the deal's still going ahead. So who's lying to who? False narratives is the politest way to say it. So Margaret, yes, there was a confidentiality clause. There are some things that are bothering me. We, it seems to me that we are resigning ourselves as though Sanders would be here. It seems to be that way. Yeah, go on. However, there are some questions, as I said, it's prevailing. Mm -hmm. How many hoteliers are here this evening? How many hoteliers are here? And guess how owners are here? I think there's some around where you want here, some, some in the right, back, behind on. you, behind you there, yeah. yeah. The reason I'm asking this fundamental question is after providing Sanders, as it were, <laughs> with so many opportunities. Yes. What is happening to our guest house owners and hotels in Tobago? And I'm going to ask another question. Yes. If I were a guest house owner or a hotelier, uh -huh. and I sit back and see that is happening, I'll engage my attorney immediately. There's this thing in Trinidad and Tobago called the Equal Opportunity Commission. Hmm. Okay, and if that is prevailing, and you're prepared under reasonable circumstances, as it seems, to give all these other people opportunities to see they're making money, why not me? And if you're not giving it to me, hmm. you'll have to tell the court why. Hmm. So I'm challenging those hotelers, those guest house owners, Engage your attorneys. It is important it may sound simplistic and foolish, but I'm saying it is necessary to do that. There's another thing that yes. is bugging me. Yes. It is. There are consequences to people's wrongdoings. Okay. What happens at the end of the day if we come to a conclusion that all they were doing was wrong. Are they going to go scotch free? And we pick up the pieces? That is one thing. And I want to leave this with some of us. I learned one time when I was going to school that if you were to engage in a contract and you can determine any element of fraud in that contract, it can be voided. Yes. So I'm saying, if peradventure, if maybe 
there's any element of fraud in the contract by misrepresenting the facts and giving us false expectations and so on. It must be voided. I'm putting that to all of us. Those of you who have big expectations that you're getting big hotel here and making big money, be mindful the time is going to come that some bright young lawyers in Tobago will find the elements of fraud and deal with it. And finally, finally, if I, Sanders Hotel, want to let to quote me, eh? hmm. Sanders Hotel, in some of its principles, may be adequate in terms of the projection yes. for revenue and all of that. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about it is, it's going the wrong place. It must not go down in Boko Reef and Island Pool. Hmm. If you put, okay. if you were to start to build that hotel, and with global, we call it global warming, hmm, it happens. And unfortunately, we suffer a few hurricanes or heavy seas and storms in the region here. And you mash up all your building down, you can point down there. And you can't build it again. So you mash up the hotel, you mash up Bukri for Nalan Pool, you mash up our wetlands, what happens then? Think about the next place now. If you want, if you're so concerned about Tobago, if you are so mindful of Tobago, then you may consider improving the north side road, go quite up to Lansoe, build something there, you have a beach there, if you want to go naked, it's your business. All those things there so that you can allow the island to be more well-balanced. I thank you very much. And I wanted to just make it clear, I am not alleging any fraud. I don't believe that anybody took a bribe, has been trying to defraud, and let me finish, has been trying to defraud anybody. We have gone down the wrong road. It will be the first time that the country has gone down the wrong road. And we have to be able to admit it's a quality of leadership that you know something, we could have gone down the wrong road, which is why it is of fundamental importance that we get an answer to the question, is it that everything is still up for discussion? Because if that is the case, we could improve this or relocate it. If it is that everything has been agreed, because up to today in the newspaper, let me be specific, again, based on facts, today's Guardian, Dr. Rowley is responding to Rodney Charles, member of parliament for the UNC. He's in the Guardian. Today's Guardian, he responded yesterday in Parliament. And Dr. Rowley made it very, very clear that nothing has been signed. Everything is up for agreement. Everything is up for discussion. Well, if that's the case, which is what was reported in today's Guardian, if that report is correct, if that's the case, we have things to discuss. We have ways to improve this. And I'd like him just to confirm that and let us go back and fix this. Let's improve it, but as it is now, it's unsatisfactory, but I wanted to make it totally clear that I'm not alleging any corruption, fraud, anything. That's not where I'm coming from. The gentleman asked what would happen to other hotels and the guest houses and so on. My name is Clyde Adams. Clyde Adams. Yes, Mr. Adams. I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, what, for instance, has been happening in Barbados is that the other hotels, other than Sandals and guest houses, have said, if Sandals is to get these benefits and concessions, so must we. That has put Mia Motley, it wasn't done by her, it was done by a previous government, but it has put her, she's now the prime minister, in a serious bind because the economy of Barbados is not, as you know, in the best possible shape. They've had to go to the IMF recently. And what I understand is that uh, they've had to, she's had to say, well, we will give you these benefits. We have to, because there has to be equity, but they have to be spread out over a period of time. And I would expect that uh, hoteliers and guest house owners in Tobago will say exactly the same thing to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, if Sandals is to get these benefits, so must we. What impact that will have on our tax base is for Mr. Imbot to tell us. 
Another point that you raised is the question of if things break down, what happens? And Sandals has to go. There is in the agreement, in the memorandum of understanding the clause, which I will read, saying, in the event that the government fails to complete the development of the resort, the government shall reimburse Sandals for all wasted costs and expenses upon request. <laughs> government means all of us. We are the taxpayers. We have to pay. Rodney Piggott. Yes, and okay. Thanks a lot for coming. And while you should not allege fraud, mm -hmm. um, I think where there are billions of dollars floating around mm -hmm. politicians, I don't think it's far-fetched for us to hmm, speculate hmm. that there might be some underhanded things going on. But my question, you actually addressed it at the end mm -hmm. when you talked about the uh, charitable position and yeah. the real world position. Yeah. Uh, in the charitable position, we said that uh, if things have not, if the deal has not been inked, then we have time to go back and bring parties to the table and get things ironed out and put in place that should be in place. Yes. I don't know, are we doing that? Or are we just saying that that's what we should be doing? Is there an actual um, <clears throat> uh, movement towards having that take place? And if it is the real world uh, view where during that time from February until now, they were actually in the back rooms working out the deal, and then the deal is done, so let's release the MOU now. If that's the case, what then are we to do? And I think that's the position that we should more than likely find ourselves in at this point, is that after we've heard all of the facts and the analysis, not just opinions, what is our action? as to Begonians at this point, and I think that's where we ought to be. What would actually happen is this, eh? Just, just to explain, um, Mr. Pigott, what would happen is this. If I was negotiating a deal like this, and I've done them, and I had 19 out of 20 points agreed, and you came back to me and said to me, well, you know, we're getting pressure from this, this, and this, so we want to change these clauses, and you want me to change them in your favor, because you're getting pressure from your shareholders or your public or whatever. I would change them, but you'll have to give me back something somewhere else. That's how it really works. I'm not going to just give you things because you ask me for things. That's not how commercial negotiators work. And in fact, that principle I'm describing here, colloquially, is in the agreement. Because they actually say that if the government in the future changes anything, laws, regulations, taxes, rules about how the hotel is treated, they have the right to be recom recompensed, compensated by some other way, which is the same thing I'm talking about. So just to understand, that's how the real, real, I don't think that, I don't think that clause is good, eh? but that's how it really works in the commercial world, private to private. So the next question is um, this gentleman here. Yeah? Where's the Tobago Vanguard in all this? H had you not stood in the breach there to try to get a uh, you know, this information to the fore, mm -hmm. uh, we might have been in a greater dilemma, all right? Um, you know, they talk about this deal, it's confidential and so on. And I'm wondering where was the competition coming from, seeing that there was a sole select and everything was thing. Mm -hmm. So how come it became so private? Anyhow, I, I'm wondering also, what role the Chinese uh, going to play in this whole construction. I really um, am concerned about the aspect you brought about the labor, right? And it's a nice thought that why not get some young people if you want to think, but that wasn't thought of, and they could bring in. I want to know what role they're going to play. And you keep ma you're making a thing that jarring on me that you're saying this is not a PNM UNC thing. No. Right? And in some respects, I understand that you're trying to say that if it was either one of the parties bringing a project like this to the table, 
you would have made the similar type of objection. Yes. But this is a straight PNM Rowley thing, right? And I want to know why, you know, how on earth is this being fostered on a people with what was presented here, what we know and what we don't know, still don't know the possible impacts it's going to have, and what really, where's the vanguard? What can we really do about it? Um, I can't answer the question. That's for people in the room to answer and other people and so on. If you want to follow the work, the work is at AfroRaymond.net and it's all available online for free. All the TV shows, radio shows, the MOU is available online, all the analysis, over 500 pieces of work. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dawn Pollock Dari Singh and I'm an attorney at Law That Practices in Tobago. Okay. I had a quick look at the uh, memorandum of understanding. Okay, yes. And I'm appalled at the majority of its contents, but in particular, and as an attorney, mm -hmm. number 17, okay. under what the... Let me just find number 17. Have it here, you know. Let me mm -hmm. just find 17. 17. Go on. Uh -huh. Under what the government is promising to do, which is procure that the necessary laws, regulations, or orders are enacted or made to give effect to this agreement and any subsequent agreements. Yes. I was not aware that that's how laws worked. Yes. I was not aware that one person in the government can sign a memorandum of, a, uh, of a, a understanding, yes, yes. which may go to a binding agreement. And if it reflects or mirrors some of these clauses that we are yes. now seeing, yes. I'm not aware that one member of government can promise or sign that laws will be enacted to give effect to an agreement. I think that's a little bit caught before the horse. I, I thought agreements had to Con <laughs> had to conform to the law. Yeah, so they had to conform to the law. Yeah. yeah, I understand what your point is. So Absolutely right, yeah. I am horrified at the contents of the, the memorandum. I, I thank you for your good work in bringing it to light. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know where to begin to say, what can we do to reverse or challenge it? What is happening here? in relation to the tax clauses in the MOU. And the clause you mentioned, what I would call, I call it the facilitation clause. Just to use a, a polite euphemism, it's a facilitation clause. What those clauses are doing is effectively within this agreement, it's non-binding, but the MOU is not legally binding, but it sets out the intentions of the parties. The clause is actually telling you that we are contracting out of the social contract. You see, it's interesting, eh? Philosophically, it's a very interesting, a deep point. Because the social contract is like this. We live in a society, and it's complicated. Some are from Trinidad, some are from Tobago, some are from Barataria. Some were in Brooklyn last week, and they came back next month, and so on, and so on. And we all Trinidad and Tobago citizens and taxpayers. And we operate a republic, which means that we all equal. There are no kings and queens and emperors and things again here. Yeah. We have elections periodically, peaceful elections, and we change government peacefully. And we install a government that was elected. And the government has the power to change laws and rules and regulations. All of that is in pursuance of things like stability and peace and education and health and proper drainage and nutrition and so on. And all of that that I describe in is the social contract. So how could one company have a contract to take themselves outside the social contract? Study it properly. So at this moment in time, VAT in this country is 12.5%. Now I'm not just spoofing. These are analyses based on the facts. I'm going back to the Antigua and Barbuda sales tax, ABST. If you go to what Gaston Brown is talking about in the video, the ABST, which is the Antiguan word for VAT, because VAT is a sales tax, the ABST was 12.5%. So every time Sandals sells a hotel room to a couple for 500 US a night, they were supposed to collect 12.5% Antiguan Barbuda sales tax. In Trinidad, they would have called it VAT. And give it to the Treasury. The administration that was in power before Gaston Brown entered an agreement with Sandals, a contract 
probably with a confidentiality clause too, or a non-disclosure, one of those fancy things. That in fact, Sandals only had to hand over 35% of the money. You ever hear anything, sir? So every other business in Antigua and Barbuda was collecting 12.5% and giving the treasury 12.5%. But Sanders had a contract signed by somebody in the cabinet that allowed them to keep 65% of the money. 65% of the people's tax. They were supposed to be doing schools and roads and hospitals and libraries like this building. Understand well what we're talking about, you know, brothers and sisters. This is not any opinion. This is an analysis of what took place in Antigua and Barbuda. When Gaston Brown was elected, although there was a confidentiality clause and a non-disclosure, because he was now the Prime Minister, he could see every file. You understand it? So he called for the file. And what they found when they audited it, 101 million EC dollars. And an EC dollar is about three to one of ours, eh? It's about 285. 101 million EC dollars had been pocketed. Listen to me well, pocketed by Sandals under that illegal and unconstitutional agreement. 101 million EC dollars is equal to 39 million US dollars for a small, poor country like Antigua and Barbuda. This is the kind of large-scale fraud we're talking about. And Gaston Brown took it upon himself as his bound on duty to challenge them and to get back that money. At which point, they put the gun to his head and closed the hotel for five months. All that is in the video. Understand what I'm talking about. It's not an opinion, it's an analysis, it's all facts. Okay? So your question, Don Palak Dari saying, your question about the constitutionality or the legality of a clause that appears to set aside the role of the parliament, because the role of the parliament is to make laws is to discuss what's happening in the country and to make a law, to increase something or to bring something down, or to put something where there was nothing before, or to take away something that doesn't make sense anymore, to create a new policy in relation to something or the other. Matters of high public importance. But you're telling me that one company, and go and read today's Guardian, because Dr. Rowley was strident on it. I strident on it too. Dr. Rowley was strident on it in response to Mr. Rodney Charles, MP for Point Up Here. Naparima, I'm sorry. Dr. Rowley was strident on the fact that the government has a right to make an agreement like that. Go and read it. Don't take my word for it. Again, facts analysis based on what Dr. Rowley said yesterday in Parliament. So we have a difference on this point. I don't think so. I don't think that's correct. Neither Dr. Rowley or myself as lawyers. We will see. I have no doubt it's going to be tested in court. We will see. But this, as far as I'm concerned, this can't stand. So I thank you for the point. Name is Deborah. Deborah. Wiggins. Yes, Deborah. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. I am echoing and I'm concerned mm -hmm. as the other uh, speakers will as yes. to where we go from here. And I think that is really the most important question now that we have been so enlightened. And I do want to thank you for what you have shared with us. It has really done you know, broaden our vision and we understand. I think people have understood before. My own friend, Mr. Um, Richard Sear, mm -hmm. had written quite extensively and had done quite a good job in exposing some of these points. What I want to challenge us is to decide what we have a nice gathering here, and I compliment Mr. Dumas for bringing us out, bringing us here together. Are we going to squander the kind of energies and the kind of um, concerns that are bubbling up in all of us? That is the question. Uh, now, as an attorney, my way of doing this, this is just my way that I'm putting forward, mm -hmm. would have been to demand that Dr. Rowley come here and face our questions and our concerns and our challenges on the several points that we have made. And certainly, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, we will expect you to be here as well. The whole of Tobago, Mr. Dumas, we sit and as 
Logical people. If I can get a flight, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get a flight. Caribbean and Airlines. And it's not a joke, eh? Yeah, 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 go on, go on. It's a profit-making place now, so I imagine they'll put on more flights. Yes, yes, yes. And we deal with it as people deal with situations like this. So sure. are we going to put that in? I don't want to say much more about anything else. Are we going to put that into operation? I'm asking us, the people of Tobago. Yeah. I want to look at this from the perspective of the ownership and governance model of this proposed development. Okay. Which is probably more important to me as a Tobagonian. And okay. Now, when you go to the MOU, uh -huh. it spoke clearly about a special purpose vehicle. There, there is a company, yeah. And that has been registered in the office of the Prime Minister by the same Maurice that yeah, you spoke Golden of. Grove, Book yeah, Limited. Golden yeah. Grove, Book Limited. Yes. And that company will be the company that will own the assets. Apparently. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. That seems to be the model that they are going mm -hmm. forward with. Correct. Correct. And while the Hilton and Regency and mm -hmm. model may have worked for the Trinidad context, yeah. when you look at the governance arrangement between Trinidad and Tobago and the fact that we have an island government mm -hmm. and this proposed facility is likely to be the largest economic installation on the island, True. I'm saying that for me, for some level of comfort, mm -hmm. I think my island government should have some level of control and influence over this, over this asset. OK, let me, let me just respond to you quickly. I mean, I don't have the answer because I'm not in government. But my interpretation of it, if I look at who is on the board of Golden Grove Baku Limited, that, that because is, that, that is optics. Well, I'm just saying that the <laughs> people who are there are people who are THA. Yeah, operatives, and I, I would be very surprised if the company did not end up vested within THA. Well, Just to, that's my interpretation of what I'm seeing from here. Well, well, but I'm obviously, seeing, the politicians will know what they're going to do, but that's what I'm, I'm see, seeing. Where I'm seeing it from is okay. that the corporate soul is your friend in Trinidad hmm, yeah. for that company. My friend and yours. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the corporate soul is probably okay, uh, the okay. Minister of Finance. I and I'm saying, saying, saying yeah. if this project has been you know, treated as the economic flip, the game changer for Tobago. And sure, I'm saying if sure. you're really doing this for the people of Tobago, then the governance and ownership model must convey that conversation to the people of Tobago. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying the Buku Golden Grove Company could have been a company created by the assembly, a special purpose vehicle created by the assembly at the inception and be genuine from the outset. And I'm saying from that perspective, yes. that will have to be one of the issues that Tobagonian must press forward it, it, to have rectified in any agreement going forward on this project or else we blow the thing up. In your opinion? In my opinion. Okay. And I guess... Let me, let me just respond to you again. This, on this point now. Yes. It's interesting. <laughs> I remember reading the little group I follow on Twitter, um, the Walter Rodney Foundation. I think it's his wife and his children run a foundation. And they put up little sayings by him every now and again. And uh, there was about three months ago, they actually had one where Rodney was speaking, coming out of Europe and the developing Africa, about how Africans in the liberated countries must own the land and the mines and the forests, yes? And the beaches and so. And that way you could have a guarantee towards independence, true, in the, true economic independence. And I responded to them by putting up a clip of when I spoke here at Tobago Benchmark back on the um, 16th of August of 2016. And I said that, in fact, the, how things have changed since Walter wrote that is that you could have a situation where you have a deed for the forest and the mine and the beach, or in this case, the big fancy resort. But, but in fact, there's an underlying commercial arrangement. That you don't have the economics. Which we never discuss. Which means that 9 out of $10 goes somewhere else. They don't pay any taxes on it. And that is why it is of fundamental importance at this point in economic development for us to understand what is the underlying commercial arrangement. And that's why that has been my focus. If it is those things are not right, the resort never gets built. Well, and if it is there right, it would benefit everybody in the country. The public could benefit from it. But this is why we need to have this discussion. So I welcome your point. I'm not well, shooting well, at you. I welcome your point. But that, that is a little, a little more in terms of what I was coming from. The other thing is that when you look at this, this is a creation. This Sanders project is yes. a creation. Yes. And in creation, you will have creatures. <laughs> 
And if you start the creation from the wrong angle, because you remember how this thing evolved, it was never evolved in probably in an organic sense. It was a man holding a man hand and bringing him here hmm. and saying, we want you to do X. And then in that kind of context, what evolved in the MOU will be a natural, a natural fallout from such an arrangement. My name is Iyuzi Adunbi. I am a concerned citizen of this country. And I want the people of this country, especially the people of Tobago, to get up and smell the coffee. When I look at Tobago's situation, where we are right now, Tobago doesn't need a sandals. Why the only aspect of development have to be some kind of hotel? Hmm? When you look at Tobago's, well, we'll say Trinidad and Tobago because it's a twin island state. But really and truly, because of Tobago's maritime resources, realistically speaking, it is the Dubai in the Caribbean region, and a lot of you all doesn't know that. And I could remember the time when I, hear, I heard our Prime Minister say, said, Sandals come in. And as the gentleman here say, the Parliament is to make laws and this and that, and government. The people, the masses, supposed to be the government. And you know what is our problem throughout this whole region? You elected a few people who are a set of followers. We have no leaders in this region. We have followers. They, they do everything to please our colonial rulers. We are an independent country on paper. In, realis, in reality, we are not. We are not. And I can tell you this, one of the, 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 one of the things that I can tell you to prove that we are not an independent country, why every time taxes are collected by our respective governments or our respect, respective parliamentarians, the bigger part of it goes to England to still pay them royalty. How many of you all knows about that? And you see these politicians in this country? In fact, throughout the whole region, they could do a lot of these things because we need a different political dispensation. The general public must be more involved. Even to pass bills, it is wrong to have how much? 31 people in the Senate and 41 in the Parliament. And they mold and shape the destiny of one point something million. It is totally wrong. When this thing stopped, then things could be going differently. And you see this whole thing about sandals? It is not the best thing for us. And a lot of people sit there and talk about what we will do and what a lot of people just thinking about short-term employment that they could get. We have to think beyond this. Just, just to respond to your point, um, uh, you see, your point about the size of the parliament, just to respond to you briefly. They're coming to help you with the microphone. The young man behind you helping you. Yeah, look him there. Yeah, yeah to respond to your point about the parliament. Um, international research shows, just to, to chime with you, the, our parliament is too small for the population we have and the complexity of the country. The parliament is too small. We need to have more members of parliament. In fact, the number is 41 and 36 senators. We need to have more members of parliament to have a proper representation that is in line with what happens in other countries. Having said all of that, it's not just a numbers game because there's a way that questions of quantity could mask questions of quality. So let's suppose for the sake of discussion, 
we doubled the number of parliamentarians. So we had 85 members of parliament. Just we talking about the point, eh? Making the laws in the country. And we had 70-something senators. If the 85 members of parliament representing areas and the 70-something senators representing different interests lack the proper standards and principles, we're still going to be in the same mess. So the point, the point I'm making is that your important point for me was the question about us as citizens engaging properly with these issues. So it's absolutely important. So thanks for the contribution. Absolutely. I'm Ian Wright, um, obviously not from here. And I'm an environmentalist. None of us really from here. People who are from here got killed out. <laughs> Nobody really from here. But go on. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just want to say just really simply, I'm obviously I'm impressed with the presentation. You're, you're an environmentalist. I'm an environmentalist. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. But what really scares me yes. about the debate tonight, uh -huh. and in a way it's playing into the actual hands of the developers of sandals of the way the government's thinking, is that almost by default, you're not, you're getting involved with the economics, where, how many people are going to be employed, mm -hmm. but you're actually not looking at the destruction of the natural capital of Tobago. Mm -hmm. So you're, it's not, it's not, <clears throat> you're, if, if we, like you said, if you're dealing in facts, it, it's an absolute fact. If this goes ahead, you will destroy your reef. If you lose your reef, you will destroy all the protection that gives. So the whole southwest corner of that island is going to be threatened by this. Mm -hmm. Starting to look at whether it's going to cost three billion or how much the country's getting into debt to build it, you've got to look at the scale of loss and the massive environmental loss, not just to, to, to Tobago, but this is a global loss. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the more you have debates like this about let's renegotiate the deal, and don't acknowledge the madness of what you're about to do, um, I think you, you, you're actually completely going in the wrong direction and playing into the hands. You, you're going to lose the madness and kind of this almost, you're going to accept, okay, we're going to destroy a hu huge element of Tobago's environment. And without an environment, you haven't got an economy. Let me just say to you, uh, is it right? Yeah, yeah Mr. Wright, that as I, as I said at the beginning, this is not a talk about everything. It certainly is not a talk about the environment. The decisive thing in projects of this size. And I mean by, by decisive, I mean if it's right, it happens. If it's not right, it doesn't happen. It's as simple as that. Is the underlying commercial arrangement. It is up, it is up to people who have this issue to lobby, like your own groups. No, I know that's what I said about, that's what I said when I started, I started talking about the collateral cost. The economists appraise those as externalities because they have costs that arise within a development, within a site, that impinge off-site. I, I went into all of those things. I don't know whether you were here or not, but I went into those issues, okay? Um, but the talk was not to talk about environmentalism, so I'm not going to come here and pretend that that is my thing. That's not my thing. That's not my expertise. Thank you, Afran. Thank you for coming. Margaret Hinkson, sure, retired um, person from the tourism sector. Okay. Environmentalist as well. So, Mr. Wright, mm -hmm. I'm continuing with the point you made. I'm also actually responding to Deborah Mingins. Has she gone? She's here. She's here. She's here. She's in front here. Um, because the question was, what can we do? Okay. Um, there is a second document in the public domain, you could see, the MOU yes. and the certificate, the application for the Certificate yes. for Environmental Clearance. I have that with me here. And what happens is that when the company fills this out and they submit it, yes. they are then going to be subject to environmental scrutiny. Okay. Angostura, in 2003, was not able to get to satisfy the environmental impact assessment needs. And so their project was scuttled. And that yes. was for half the number of rooms yes. that Sandals is now applying for. Mm -hmm. So that if, and this is the big if, if the EMA and through the, uh, through the local agency here, the Division of the Environment, if they do their job properly and like professionals and are not 
subject to political pressure, which is what we are fearing, they will find that they have to give equal uh, weight or even more em emphasis and require yeah. environmental impact analysis. Okay. So that among the questions that, and I know Kamau is here, and he's the one for GGBL who would have sent this in. Uh, question 13, site preparation and construction. Does the project require major earthworks? Yes. Clearing, yes. Cutting, yes. Excavation, yes. Grading, yes. Does the site require filling, yes. Reclamation, yes. Coastline stabilization and alteration, yes. Would the project require major waterworks such as diversion of water courses, yes. Creation of standing water bodies, yes. And then, surprisingly, question 23, will the project have adverse effects on the aesthetics of the area where it is located, resulting in radical changes to the landscape? No. <laughs> so, something is not right with this application, and I really just hope that they're not going to try to go through the back door with the Angostura approvals of 2003 that Angostura couldn't meet. It lapsed in 2006. It is no longer valid. Mm -hmm. And I really hope this is how we can get a little handbrakes pulled up. Because if the EIA is properly done and we should demand it, this cannot go on in the Buku Reef Marine Park. Yeah. It simply can't meet the standard. Okay. So that there are two issues here. Buku Reef Marine Park, the location mm -hmm. of, of the project, yes. and sandals as a type of Development. hotel development. Yeah, yeah. That's, Understood. that's Understood. my contribution. My name is Kamau Akili. I am reluctantly coming here because my name was called. <laughs> I just want to make it clear. One, there was actually a CC granted to Angostura in 2006. Mm -hmm. There was. It has lapsed, yes. Mm -hmm. But there was a CC granted, and that CC would have included reclamation of wetlands, approximately 14 to 15 acres. I'm just saying that. Okay. Secondly, I stand here to say, because I am an advisor to this project, that so far, we have complied with the law in spirit and in letter. Mm. I don't know what people are claiming. We are following the rules. There is a development concept. The proposal is at the concept stage. And we have submitted that to the EMA, and they have requested additional information, which is what we are seeking to provide at this stage. And that's where we are. Some of the proposals may materialize, some may not. But let the science and logic determine what happens. That's where we are. So I can understand some of the discussion about subterfuge and whatever. It's clear. And let me just say this. For those of us who are familiar with the history of EIA applications in this country, this is probably one of the first instances, I don't know if anybody could correct me, where at this stage of an application, extensive knowledge of what is proposed has been made fully available. No confidentiality clause. If you look at the application, I think it is section 26. It asks, should this be confidential or not? My ans my, what I put there was no. That is why the information is available to all and sundry. So at this stage, there's nothing to hide. We go through the process. And people have the opportunity to make their contribution. The MA has their job to do. We have our job to do. I just wanted to make that very clear. Thank you. 
I am glad that Mr. Keeley came to the mic. Okay, I just... Deborah, you have the privilege. This is the last question, okay? So oh, you have I the see. last turn to bat. Oh, sorry. So, I, yeah, go ahead. I think sorry. there are others who have more punch than my question will have. Well, you but I simply wanted to ask Mr. Keeley if um, what Margaret read out is correct. I don't know, it may or may not be. From the application? Yes. Whether, in fact, after those questions that the tick was yes, 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 yes. Is it logical? We are laymen, so perhaps you would educate me that at the end of that, when the question is asked whether, Margaret, what is the exact words? Whether that answer of no is a truthful answer. Hmm. Whether it's logical, whether we for whom you are opening up and you're not, you're, you're releasing confidentiality, whether we can conclude that that answer is logical well, okay. and to be accepted. Well, okay, you have a last or question. Scientific. It looks like we have a last answer to come now. So we're going again. A last answer now. Can't get away. Um, Can't get away. All right, go ahead. Look, brother, let me go just ahead. say. Yeah, you answer now, yeah. yeah. There's nothing logical or scientific about aesthetics. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. First of all, <laughs> you know, having, having said, said that. And Nelly said, you answered that like a real tree, but then I remember in Tobago. So go ahead. Having, having said that, yeah. if one checks the outline, wow. it says that only 17% <laughs> of the total acreage is going to be subjected to build development. 70%. 17%. 1-7%. Seventh percent. Okay, okay. Keep going, keep going. 17%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Much of that estate is either abandoned past, yeah? No one. Please. Please. The question is if there will be radical. Please, will there be radical change to the aesthetics? We can differ on that. That's, I am saying that is a subjective issue, and I am not going to argue that with anybody. I'm sorry. Aesthetics is subjective. Thank you. I was so happy. Thank you. When I saw my good friend. Oh, gosh. Mr. Akili came to defend his position. Good. We worked together. He was president of Environment Tobago. I yes. was vice president. Okay. But you must never forget where you came from. Hmm. You see, I am from that Canaan Bonacord area. Hmm. And I don't want to see the destruction of that place. When you put all those things there, what happens to the you talk about the, it was abandoned. I, as a little boy, used to go on no man's land. We can't go there again. We used to swim around the, 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 um, the, the lagoon. We can't go there again. We used to go in Golden Grove Estate and the, the, the beach there. We would not be able to go there again. You're putting 25 restaurants going out in the, in the Dylan pool there. We would not be able to use it again. Listen to me. Let us not allow ourselves to be fooled. Let us think. But I like the idea. We, it's a pity we couldn't develop a consensus here today. But they gave the idea that we must bring Mr. Sorry, Dr. Rowley here to answer the questions. Do that quick, quick, quick. Okay. As fast as you can, so you can see if to be going on, eh? Okay. I've attended many meetings in this room. It's the first time I've seen so many people and the first time I've seen so much, uh, well, let me use, uh, I used to be in the foreign service, so let me try to find the correct word. Um, <laughs> so much engagement. Um, and I thank you all. There is the proposal made by Deborah Mormigans, and that is something that um, I don't think we can discuss now, but it is certainly something that um, I will get in touch with Deborah on and see 
to what extent it can be pursued. For now, I want to thank you all for having come, for having participated so well. And I want particularly, of course, and I'm sure you all too want to thank particularly Afra. <laughs> and you, you, you understand now uh, why some people in, in, in positions of authority are not exactly enthused by things that he says and things that he does. But he's an activist, he's a man of independence, as you have heard tonight and you no doubt knew before, a man who speaks his mind, who is not swayed by this or that political ideology or party, and the sort of person, quite frankly, that we need more of in Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you all for having come. Thank you all for having participated. As I said, I will have uh, words with Deborah and uh, others to see to what extent this matter can be pursued and have a nice trip back home and have a good Christmas. And let us see what happens in 2019. Thank you.